Greetings, Earthers, Martians, Belters, members of the OPA. Welcome to episode 18 of Expanse, the unofficial podcast. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. And I'm your host, Nikki Starwalker. Well, Nikki, we've made it the last uh, push (laughs) for season one. Today, we are talking about the ninth episode, Critical Mass. Yeah. I can't believe we're at the finale already. Well, this isn't the finale. Next episode's (laughs) the finale. But yeah, this this season went by super fast. Yeah, definitely. And it felt like to me these last two episodes were kind of the finale (laughs) because they just fit so well together. So yeah, let's just get into talking about critical mass. Anything you want to start out with that you liked about this episode, Nikki? Sure. I really like the fact that we got to see more of Julie Mao in this episode and uh, learn what what happened from her point of view. Yeah, I really liked the whole flashback uh, to her on the scopuli, and we got to see what went down with that. And yeah, I, I really liked it too. At first, I was a little like, what? Because we were seeing a lot of things that we'd seen in the first couple episodes kind of again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we were seeing it from a slightly different perspective and seeing a lot more uh, of what was going on kind of in between what we'd seen before. So I thought it was really cool to kind of see it from her perspective. And one thing that that I really liked is this episode, we, we really saw kind of the horror of what she went through in a way that, at least to me, didn't come through in the book. Okay. In the book, I remember we we start out with the scene of, of her locked in the the locker, and you know that was that was kind of rough because they were talking about how you know she was in there for days and pissed herself and all this stuff, and and yeah. so that was kind of I, I wouldn't call it horror, but it was kind of like oh that would suck, but that was kind of it. You know, where this, like, we're really seeing what she went through and her exposure to the proto molecule. And, and I thought it was super cool. And it really gave, like, a lot of emotional impact to this that I think it, it would have really been lacking otherwise. Yeah, that's great. Um, really good insight. And I totally agree. I like the fact that we got to really understand Julie a little bit more and become a little more attached to her as a person. For instance, on the scopuli, like her shipmates seem to genuinely like her. Um, Of course, it could be just because they were flirting with her, but (laughs) she seemed to be a nice person to them and someone that they felt was truly on their side. And I really liked that she said that she really wants to be rescued because Semi was uh, talking to Miller and saying, you know, what if she doesn't even care? What if she doesn't want to be rescued because she's hardcore OPA? And we learned that that's really not the truth. She's a human. She's out there all alone and she does want to be saved. I thought it was cool that we actually saw the moment where she became infected. She she touched some of the goo that was on on the wall which, you know, just just a word of advice for you kids. Uh, any Anything that's like ooey gooey sticky and looks possibly organic and you don't know what it is, probably best not to touch it. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, you know, we, we see a lot of things that up to this point we kind of inferred or we heard about, but we didn't really get to see. I thought it was cool that we got to see all this stuff in this episode. So we see Julie uh, launch the beacon uh, from the Anubis, which was what Fred picked up and Mm -hmm. and sent Holden and crew to go investigate, which resulted in them finding the Anubis. And we got to see her launch the little shuttle and head to Eros. So I I thought that was really cool. And, And I think that the way that they did stuff from like the first episode from her perspective. Not only was it cool to kind of show us some of the pieces of the puzzle that maybe we were missing, but it was also a great way to kind of refresh you uh, for those people that aren't watching every episode two times or more, um, you know, what happened all the way back in episode one and kind of how this all kind of fits together. And I thought that was really cool because I I don't know that I've seen a show do that in, in exactly that way before. 
And I think it was maybe a little risky because again, you know, we're seeing a lot of scenes that we'd already seen, but I think it worked. And, and I think it was a really great way to do that with a show as complex as this and to kind of bring everybody up to speed so that you really understand what's happening in this episode and, and why all this matters and how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. I also like that they did the full title sequence in this episode I thought that was really cool and and clever because, again, it's kind of another callback to that first episode. And it's almost like we're seeing the first episode again from a from a different point of view. So I yeah. thought it was cool that they did the, uh, the the full title sequence for this episode. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I really liked how in Julie's room, she's so sick, right? And she's got in this hotel room and she's on the floor and she's watching the TV screen and on it is Dawes speaking and they reflect the screen back onto her face. And you see this a lot on television when somebody's being brainwashed. I thought that was kind of interesting that she idolizes him so much and he won't come and rescue her. And she, you really get the sense that she's kind of in a, in a way, brainwashed by the OPA and its movement. Yeah, and they, they totally used her. Yeah, exactly. I thought her death sequence was super cool. That was really well done. And I know in the end of, I think it was the last episode where, where they find her, you know, you and I were a little unimpressed with, you know, how she looked. Mm-hmm. Um, but this episode, we, we see more detail, and, and I thought it was super cool. And, and I think I even said that to you at the time because you were like, oh, I don't know about kind of what they did with the proto molecule there. Yeah. And I was like, well, we, we just saw it from one angle for like a brief moment. So, you know, it may there, there may have been more to it than what we saw. And, and there totally was. And I thought it was cool because they really showed how this thing was invading her and not only like taking over her body, but also her mind mm -hmm. and, and her senses. And, you know, we have the bit where she's destroying all the electronics in the room. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, like we understand that the electromagnetic radiation makes this thing grow faster, right? right. But I don't think she was thinking that at all. Um, I mean, she definitely had the information and, and the intelligence to put that together. But I think in that moment, it was just, it was causing her pain. You right. know, the way they, they kind of conveyed that was almost like this sound that these things were making her that, that was causing her pain. And she was just, you know, it's like if you have a migraine and, and like the room's too bright, you just turn off all the lights, you know, right. there, there's no real reason behind it. It's just like this stimulus is hurting me, so I'm getting rid of it kind of thing. Yeah. I, I thought that was cool. Yeah, totally. And it made a big difference when they animated the virus on her and it glowed and seemed to be crawling on her skin. <laughs> that made it a lot more effective. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was really cool that right before she died, she saw a vision, for, for lack of a better word, of Miller mm -hmm. um, and the sparrow. The sparrow was interesting uh, that that was part of it. Um, I actually think I know why she saw Miller Ooh. Um, and I, I imagine that a lot of people that have read the books probably are thinking the same thing that I am, but I, I don't want to talk about it because it, it's massive, massive spoilers for uh, season two. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. <laughs> so if, if you're wondering why she saw Miller and you think that was kind of maybe a little hokey or maybe going a little too far with the artistic license, um, just hold tight. Yeah. And uh, I, I have a feeling that, that, you know, they'll connect those dots for us in season two. And uh, yeah, they're really good at doing that. So <laughs> just just hold out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, the next the next big event in this episode is uh, what I like to call the Eros experiment begins. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so we we go to. Uh, Miller and Holden and everyone else uh, on Eros dealing with that whole situation. Yeah, I loved after Miller found Julie, 
I love the sound work um, when he's walking through Eros and it just kind of with the sound and the lighting and of course the wonderful acting, you got the sense that his world was just kind of blown apart. Like it didn't really answer all of his questions and um, he was pretty torn up about what happened to Julie. I thought it was awesome how they transitioned from showing us what happened to Julie to now we're with Miller and Holden. I, I just thought that was brilliant how they did that because we're with Julie, she's dying, and then we hear them coming in the room. Like we're almost from her point of view still, mm -hmm. which uh, again might seem like hokey artistic license, but again, there's reasons for this that will be clear in, in season two, I think. And and then, you know, we shift to now we're with Miller and Holden and and it was just seamless and beautiful how they did that that transition. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Great writing and I I don't know. I'm not sure like who all would have been involved in in um putting that together, but yeah, that was that was awesome. I really mm -hmm. liked that. That was very artful. <laughs> <laughs> So, so kind of what, what happens on Eros, it just kind of give you the bottom line um, in case you're a little like, what's going on here? So we see the guy Dresden come in and he starts taking fluid from, from Julie's corpse. And, you know, he mentions injections. And then later we see a ship is blown up in the hangar on Eros. Holden finally <laughs> does the math and figures out that they blew it up on purpose, which creates this emergency, this radiation warning, which gives them an excuse to gather people into these radiation shelters. And, and you saw as people were going into the shelters, they were injecting them. And they said something like, you know, this is mandatory radiation medicine or whatever. Well, they were injecting them with what they took from Julie. And the irony here is they put them into these shelters that are sealed against radiation. The idea is this is a place to stay away from radiation, but instead they get everybody in there and then they bombard them with radiation mm -hmm. to make the, we're just going to call it the protomolecule, uh, grow faster within them. And uh, Holden and Miller point out, and, and they also find out from the CPM guy uh, that, you know, these all these uh, gangsters from series that way back when, like, Miller found out like Golden Bow and all of them were disappearing. It's like, where, where are all the gangsters going? Well, they were hired to come here to Eros and they've been uh, installing surveillance equipment and scientific monitoring equipment and all this stuff. And now they're setting up these transmitters. So all this is, is painting this picture of, you know, this is an experiment. They have this biological agent whatever it is, they're infecting people with it, they're accelerating its growth, and then they're monitoring what happens. Pretty terrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just gruesome and just callous and, and complete disregard for, for human life. And someone, I, I don't remember which character it was, but someone in the episode even said something to the effect that, you know, they're belters, so they don't even see them as human. Yep. Yeah. And when they had these different gangs um, being used in this way in the books, I was worried that it wouldn't carry on to the television show. I thought it would add a little too much complexity or something. I'm so glad they kept that. <laughs> it's a really neat twist. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So we also see in this episode and in, in the next episode, which we'll we'll talk about as well, that, you know, Miller has completely gone off the rails. Like he sees Julie and he just, you know, what little ethics and morality he had, which wasn't a lot to begin with, they're, they're gone now. He's shooting people at the drop of the hat. He's just, he is <laughs> off the rails. And Miller and Holden finally get to exchange a few more words. And Miller ends up pinning Holden to the wall in one scene. And Naomi is begging Amos to help, to step in and do something. And I'm just thinking, Amos doesn't owe, owe Holden anything. Like, Holden's been pretty shitty to Amos. Yeah, yeah. We, we also find out that Earth is who built, built the stealth ships. And that's, uh, that's a pretty big reveal. And uh, we'll, we'll have to see how Vassarala copes with that. 
I loved Fred's speech when he revealed this too. Yeah, that was that was a great performance and a great speech. And I can't wait to see more Fred Johnson. Me too. <laughs> I, I just love him in, in this show. Nikki, was it was there anything else you wanted to talk about Critical Mass, episode nine? Yeah, just one more thing. I thought it was really strange while I was watching the episode that Ava Sarala took three pencils from Frank's office. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I kind of understood you wanted something to remember the man by, but pencils, you know? And then later we found out in this episode that they actually have something on them. And that yeah, they're really flash drives. Cool. Yeah, that was so neat. I can't wait to get that technology. All right. So at this point, we're going to transition into episode 10, which is called Leviathan Wakes, which just a piece of trivia here. That's also the title of the first novel of The Expanse. Yeah, I love that. It was a nice little tribute. So if you're looking for something to do in the downtime while you're waiting for season two, go read Leviathan Wakes. So in this episode, things go from bad to worse. <laughs> <laughs> something I, I thought was really interesting in this, and I'm looking forward to see the fallout of this in season two, is uh, Na- Naomi is showing off some major uh, OPA knowledge. Mm-hmm. here and and throughout this season we've had this kind of arc with her and the crew where you know way back when on the Donager the Martian Navy planted the idea in their head of oh Naomi's an OPA terrorist you know mm-hmm. and that was really never resolved and now here they are on Eros and she knows about you know, the secret tunnels that the OPA use and, and the way that they navigate them and, and mark the, the route and all this stuff. And you see even Amos at one point kind of gives her the sidelong look like, uh, we're going to talk about this later, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to the scene in season two where uh, they confront her about that because I think there's going to be some hard questions for Naomi. But, you know, uh, Rightfully so in this episode, nobody's really concerned about that because they're all just worried about staying alive and getting the hell off of Eros. Yep. Yeah. And I like how Semi questioned her at one point and was, you know, confronting her about not knowing what she was doing. And um, she proves that she does. And Amos just kind of looks at him like, yeah, this is why I trust her and I follow her. Like she's she knows what she's doing. She knows where she's going. <laughs> Perhaps too much so. But we'll find <laughs> out about that. Right. There are some great uh, just one liners in this episode. I, I think I wrote down like six of them. So at this point, we, we come to a couple of them that I really enjoyed. We've, we've got one uh, by Miller where he's talking to Holden and, and he says something like, uh, the entire system thinks you're some kind of hero, but you're really kind of clueless, aren't you? <laughs> I was like, yes. Again, Holden in a nutshell. I, I love it. Yeah. And this after Holden admitting that he's never shot anyone. <laughs> he looks so scared. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, you know, there is a there is a cool moment when they're in the little casino room or whatever, mm-hmm. and the the CPM guy comes in there and and starts playing the game. Which the beginning of that game, I swear it was Donkey Kong. Was he <laughs> playing Space Donkey Kong? I inquiring minds want to know. But uh, I used to play a lot of Donkey Kong back in the day, so I, I recognize that that little ditty that they they play at the beginning of the levels. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> They're in there and the guy comes in to to play Donkey Kong and sees Holden and they have this wrestling match with the guy because they can't shoot him because then everybody will know they're in there. They manage to presumably kill him, although they could have just knocked him out. It's kind of hard. It seemed like they killed him. But um, there's this kind of moment where Miller and Holden kind of share this look, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, Miller's gone off the rails. He's shooting people in the face, um, you know, and Holden's like, what the fuck is up with this guy? But now, you know, Holden's got blood on his hands now, too. And and they kind of share this look, you know, and and I got the sense of Holden kind of being like, I'm turning into Miller, basically. <laughs> I, I thought that was cool. My favorite line from them being in there was that Miller said, optimism's for assholes. And for Earthers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> another great. great one was uh, he was actually quoting Semi and, and he, he said that Semi asked him when he was talking about how they became cops. 
He said, Sammy asked him, do you want to be an ass or do you want to be a boot? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I wrote that one down too. (laughs) It's funny. I saw this episode twice and both times I heard the, do you want to be an ass? And my brain thought he was going to go to, then we should be cops because then you can be an ass and get paid for it. (laughs) But then he went for the boot thing, which was way better. That was was quite clever. I like that. (laughs) And, and then there's the bit where he sees Julie and she's like, which are you now, the ass or the boot? And, and Miller doesn't answer her because he's the boot. <laughs> he has turned that corner. He's got off the rails. Miller's the boot now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this is actually the Miller I like. Like, this is when I really start to like Miller is uh, when, when he kind of loses it and... Uh, I, I like it because he takes very decisive actions. Like he doesn't sit there and ponder what to, he just does something. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. You know, I heard that um, Julie say that and I actually thought he was the ass because here he is beaten up, didn't get there in time to save Julie. And it seemed like he really had the wool pulled over his eyes and, you know, screwed over by his captain. And now he's fired and now he's sick with radiation poisoning. <laughs> Right. Well, I think up and to up to this point he's been the ass, but I think now he's the boot. Okay. Now he's he's getting getting his. And he's shooting people and he's he's taking out the guys that are if not responsible for this, at least involved with it. Yeah. Every chance he gets. Yeah, he does try to shoot that mad scientist Dresden and Holden stops him and I think that was in the last episode, but I was just like, "No, don't stop him. He obviously is so evil." So we also had an interesting scene in this episode where Avasarala confronts Aaron Wright. And this is when I think she first starts to understand that he's behind all this. And then Jules Pierre Mao shows up and it's like you can see the pieces start fitting together in her mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when she was watching Fred... Um, give his speech you could just see that she believed Fred was telling the truth she was just kind of nodding along to him and you're right that that scene with Aaron Wright was one of my favorites there's another scene in this episode where they took something a very tropic thing that we've seen a million times and they kind of put that different spin on it which I, I really like it when when they do that with the show and it almost seems like any time they do a trope, they do that. Like, it's almost like they made a creative decision of, we're going to observe and use some of these tropes, but every time we use a trope, we're going to do something different with it. We're, we're not ever going to just take the safe, you know, this is what's done, been done before route. And that's when um, Miller and Holden take the uniforms from the CPM guards that they shot. I mean, how many times... Have you seen in a TV show or a movie, you know, the taking of the enemy uniforms, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always like this kind of non thing that happens. A lot of times it happens off camera or, but it's never like, it never means anything, especially to the protagonist. The protagonist is just like, oh, now I'm undercover, you know, and that's all there is to it. But in this, we, we see how, you know, I think both of them, but especially Holden are like deeply disturbed by, you know, pulling the clothes off the corpse of someone that you just shot and and you're going to wear that now. And I thought that was really cool because it's like, well, that's how it would be. You know, if, if you were in that situation for real, I mean, yeah, you'd probably do do it if you had to to survive, but it wouldn't be like just like a walk in the park. Mm-hmm. Like it would it would impact you. You know, it's like I'm going to pull these clothes off this corpse of someone I just killed And then I'm going to put them on. Yeah. Yeah. I I thought that was cool. So we also find out that Frank actually did not commit suicide. It looks like Aaron Wright had him killed because Frank knew or found out about the ships that were built by Earth. So that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how Avasarala actually sends Arjun, her husband, away. Um, and he's worried about her safety, but she's just like, no, I'll be all right as long as I play my part as the the old granny who doesn't know that the world has passed her by. Yeah, totally. Because that's what Aaron Wright expects from her, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because she's very, 
She's very stubborn, and I hesitate to use the word petty, but she almost seems a little petty in that, you know, up to this point, it's like she has her eye on something and she just won't give it up. Mm -hmm. And I think Aaron Wright sees her as petty in that way. Right. And she's perceptive enough to know that and say, hey, I can actually use this against him and I can kind of play into what he expects me to do and then he won't see me coming. Right. So I, I thought that was that was pretty cool. And, you know, my my first initial reaction to finding out that Frank was killed and didn't commit suicide was actually a slight disappointment because I thought it was a cool character thing for Vasarala that this guy that she considered her friend that she basically betrayed to do what she thought she had to do killed himself because of it. And Mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, how is she going to live with that? You know, well, now she finds out, well, he didn't kill himself. He was murdered. So it's a little bit less weight on her shoulders. Um, and, and there's still a little bit like this feeling of slightly missed opportunity there. But I thought it was cool that this happens after she goes to his house and, and meets with his husband. Mm-hmm. You know, so she still had to deal with that and didn't have the ability to say, oh, he didn't really kill himself. He was murdered. Right. So so that was cool. So they still kind of kept that. You know, she still kind of had to deal with that. Right. But long term, it's it's not going to be quite so bad as if, you know, he killed himself. Although I'm sure she'll still feel guilty because it, it could definitely be argued that she's still responsible for his death because she's the one that got him wrapped up in all this. Mm-hmm. Holden and Miller's armor that they put on after they killed those two guys kind of reminded me of samurai for some reason. And I really liked how they were injecting themselves um, with the anti-radiation medication. And (laughs) Miller asked Holden about the side effects and he said something like, oh, possible anxiety, a skin rash, sudden death. (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty funny. And just, you know, in case you didn't connect the dots, that armor that they're putting on is the armor that came up missing on series, the riot gear that uh, Miller and Octavia, I think it was, found were missing because they were going to deal with the riots and they were like, all the riot gear is gone. Oh, yeah. So so that had been taken to Eros to outfit all these these thugs posing as cops or or security or what have you. That was great. (laughs) So Semi actually gets himself killed by um, holding a gun to Naomi. And I really loved Wes in this episode. I loved Amos the character, but I loved the acting as well. And he had some great lines as well. Um, And he kills Semi for trying to challenge Naomi, I suppose, and holding a gun to her, of course. And he's just like, hey, if we stay, we stay. You know, if if the boss tells me to stay, then that's what we're doing. And he says something like, I'm just going to take this downstairs and clean it up. Like after he kills Sammy, it's no big deal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, every episode there, there's usually like one or two of the actors that I'm just like blown away, but it was pretty much the whole, the whole cast this episode, uh, Kaz Amvar, Wes Chatham, Dominique Tipper, Stephen Strait, Thomas Jane, I mean, they were all bringing it in this episode. It, it, was, it was amazing. Great stuff. I love how Miller starts the riot between the CPM guys and Mao's men. You know, him and, him and Holden are, are suffering from radiation sickness. They're trying to get to the Rossi. And they're like, we need to get through all these guys that are like bickering. Um, because basically what was happen- happening there were the CPM guys were, were told to go to this dock and that they were going to get passage off of Eros. Well, of course, that was total bullshit. Like it was never planned for them to get away. And so Mao's men are like, oh, no, you need to go to the other dock on the other side of the asteroid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're trying to get them to let them on the ship and they're not going to let them on the ship. So they're kind of, you know, button heads. And so Miller just poses as one of the the CPM guys and just starts like raising the rabble uh, to the point of conflict. And I thought it was so great because as a cop, you know, he's been on the other end of that so many times. And we even had a scene on series where he kind of diffused a riot. And in the book, there was actually a few scenes like that. 
so it's kind of cool to see him like take that knowledge and like use it for evil and <laughs> like, well, I know how to put down a riot. I also know how to get one started. <laughs> <laughs> he can use the exact lines that he's heard so many times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was great. And and then uh, so they finally make it to the dock and <laughs> the the door opens and Miller looks down and he's hallucinating at this point. He thinks he sees Julie and he's like beautiful or whatever. So then Holden looks and it's Amos standing there <laughs> and and Amos is just like, you guys look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was so great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. And, you know, a lot of times people talk about like in horror, something that you need in horror is comedy, mm-hmm. right? Because if you just have like a movie that's just horror and suspense the whole time, it's like, it's like listening to loud music. You know, you're like in your car and, and you hear a song that you really like and, and you crank it up and it's really loud and you're jamming to it. And by the end of the song, it doesn't sound as loud as it did. You're like, did I turn it down? It doesn't seem as loud as it was. And you, you want to keep like turning it up and it's because you just get used to it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> so if it's just horror and suspense all the time, like you get kind of desensitized and it just doesn't hit you, you know? So, so the trick is to have some moments of levity and comedy to kind of give you that kind of emotional release of like, oh, the tension's gone, ha, ha, ha. And then bam, they hit you with the scare or the really horrific thing. And I, I'm guessing that's why we had so many great one-liners in this episode but, you know, this episode, um, this one and, and the last one, I feel like was the best horror in the season and also the best comedy in the season. And, and I don't think it's an accident that they were in the same episodes. It's great stuff. Very observant of you. I, I was cracking up so many of the lines in this, this episode. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> So we finally see the Rossi freed from not only Eros, but those stupid gas tanks. <laughs> and that was, a, that was a really cool scene. And you notice uh, Alex is really getting the hang of flying that ship. You remember when, when they first grabbed it off the Donager, like he had some issues getting it out of the dock. And, and there was the, the little bit where... Um, he actually flies it into the wall and one of the PDCs like retracts at the last second to avoid getting damaged. He's not having those problems anymore. Like he's really gotten a, gotten a feel for her. And I just, I just loved, you know, he said something like you're a gunship and I'm a Navy pilot or something like that mm-hmm. b- because he's trying to get the clamps off. And, you know, first they, they, uh, they stranded, uh, what's his name? Kenzo. Holden yeah. strands him there, who was someone that could have gotten the docking clamps off for him. And and so he he gets what's coming to him, which was great to see. They shoot Semi, who was someone else that could have gotten the docking <laughs> clamps off. So it's like they still got this problem of the docking clamps. And Alex is like trying to like hack the system or try all these code words he knows to, to get him to disengage and it's not working. And he says to Naomi, I can't get these clamps off. And Naomi's like, deal with it, you know, because yeah. she's worried about Miller and Holden dying of radiation. Right. And so Alex is like, fine, I will deal with it. You know, <laughs> I have expected him to start like firing torpedoes at stuff. Or Me something. too. Um, but then he says the line about it, you know, the, the Rossi being a, a gunship and him being a Navy pilot and he starts like just trying to kind of muscle his way out of the clamps and and that's not happening so then he finally jettisons the the gas tanks and i don't know to me like there's some beautiful symbolism there because it's like the rossi is a weapon right and and it's like it's like it was sheathed it was it's like it was a sheathed sword and him ejecting the gas tanks was like pulling out the sword out of the sheath mm-hmm. and it was also like we're not pretending anymore, you know, fuck this pretending to be nobody or pretending to be harmless or pretending not to be involved in what's going on. Fuck that. We're in a gunship. I'm a Navy pilot. We're not hiding anymore. You know, bring (laughs) it, (laughs) which is a big change from the Alex that we saw 
at the beginning of the season, you know, when, when he's like, I'm, I'm a glorified bus driver, you yeah, know, I, yeah. I, I haven't had combat experience, you know. <laughs> or even cowering behind the couch during the gunfight. Yeah, <laughs> which wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> he's come so far. <laughs> yeah, that, that was great. I really love that. <laughs> and it was just a beautiful shot too. <laughs> yeah, awesome effects of of the Rosi like getting out of there and mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. So something interesting I I thought was uh we have the scene of Dresden on the Anu or not the Anubis but on one of the stealth ships presumably and he's like monitoring the data coming in from Eros and and watching the feeds and everything. And he mentions you know, sending all the information to Thoth. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed like someone online somewhere was like, oh, who's Thoth? What's that? You know, mm -hmm. any theories, you know? And I was like watching that. I'm like, Thoth, Thoth. I know that. I'm like, that's an Egyptian god, I'm pretty sure. Just like Anubis, right? Yeah. So uh, I looked on Wik Wikipedia and indeed Thoth was a, an early Egyptian god, the god of knowledge. Oh, wow. So there's a clue for you right there. Good God find. of knowledge. Wow. So I think, you know, still there's there's more to this than than meets the eye. <laughs> you know, even now you, you might be thinking, I think I got this figured out. I think I know what's going on, you know, with the bioweapon and all this stuff. Yeah, there's there's more layers. We're still peeling that onion, man. <laughs> How deep does this onion go? <laughs> <laughs> Keeps unfolding. And we just get more questions. So Eros, I just wanted to comment, looked so cool. The yeah, set design. Super cool. Yeah. It looked really trashed. Um, the emptiness of it with everyone being locked up or gone was very creepy. And it actually reminded me of a sewer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, especially because they were in those maintenance tunnels. And that was very much, you know, in a lot of shows or movies, like they would be in the sewers, right? right, right. So I, I imagine that was at least somewhat deliberate. Yeah, yeah. I meant above ground too, because the entryways um, to all the different passages were round and the way that there were pipes on the ceiling. Now, I'm not an expert on what sewers look like, but from what I've seen on TV, <laughs> that's what it reminded me of. Well, I imagine those uh, round entranceways are emergency bulkheads. Oh, okay. In case there's any kind of uh, loss of atmosphere or any, anything, they can seal it seal it off, I would guess. I, I would think that would be like standard fare in places like that. Mm -hmm. I actually felt a little bit bad for Kenzo. In the very last scene, he gets taken away. <laughs> I don't feel bad. Fuck him. <laughs> Fuck you, Kenzo. You got what was coming to you. <laughs> It was really neat how apparently the proto molecule tried to imitate his size and like stood in front of him and was seeming to mirror his actions. And that happened right before it took him. Um, I love the end credits, how they had the creepy empty station noises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I think he got what was coming to him. I, I mean, remember pretty much every word that you've heard out of his mouth has been a lie. In fact, what, what do you think, Nikki? I bet money he didn't even have a wife or kids. Oh, that no, I didn't. That was total bullshit. Yeah, I didn't believe that. And Holden knew it, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that was, that was another of those moments between Holden and Miller when, you know, Kenzo's wanting to come with them and Holden's like, no, you're going the other way. And Kenzo's like, you, you realize that's a death sentence, right? And Holden's like, yeah, get going. And he starts like shooting at him to like get him to run away. And he, he like empties his clip and he's like freaking out. And then you, Miller's standing there watching. Yeah. And it's like, again, they share this look and it's like they're becoming more alike, you know. <laughs> and you know Holden is very judgmental. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and it's probably not a spoiler to say that he's going to have some words with Miller about some of the callous shooting people in the face and whatnot that maybe could have been avoided. But it's like in this moment, there's kind of this acknowledgement of they're, they're more alike than either one of them would probably want to admit. Yep. Yep. Something changed in Holden when they took off those men's equipment and put them on themselves. So that is the end of season one. 
we've made it 10 episodes. If you've watched this much of the show and you're not hooked, um, if you're just not feeling it, then I'd say it's probably just not for you. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe, I don't know, check your pulse, make sure you're, you're still alive. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, there's still um, a lot more to come. We're still just like scratching the surface of the larger story. But I I think at this point, there's been enough revealed that that you probably have a pretty good sense of the scope of of what we're dealing with and that it's just going to keep getting better and more complex and more mind blowing as as we go episode to episode season to season right Nikki oh yeah I'm super excited and you're not even as far in the books as I am so you don't even realize how how much your mind will be blown (laughs) (laughs) you got to get caught up so we could talk about it all right (laughs) I don't have to worry about spoiling things anymore so yeah, so this is this is our last uh, commentary episode for for season one of our podcast. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, we may have some some more episodes uh, coming down the pipe uh, before season two. Um, we might have uh, some more interviews, maybe. Uh, keep your fingers crossed. Uh, definitely stay su- subscribed. Um, check your feed or check the website every now and then to see uh, if there's something new. The best way, though, to, to stay in touch is follow us on Twitter, and uh, I'll definitely tweet if or when I release a new episode, and you'll know. Also, you can join our Google Plus community, and we'll, we'll let people know on there as well when there's a new episode. So you can follow me on Twitter, at Lex Starwalker. You can follow me at Nikki Starwalker. And you can visit our website, starwalkerstudios.com, and you can find the show notes there. You can find a link to the Google Plus community and uh, everything you need there. And if you would like to reach us, you can email us at expansepodcast at gmail.com. So, Nikki, any uh, end of the season final parting thoughts? Just stay strapped in because we just got started. Yeah, yeah. So... I am super excited for season two. I have a feeling that the wait for season two is going to be even more long and agonizing than the wait for season one was once we (laughs) found out this was going to be a thing. So, yeah, hopefully uh, sci-fi leaves the episodes up so we can just keep watching them over and over and over again. I think I am going to sit down and binge watch the whole season now. (laughs) Um, You know, we've watched every episode at least twice at this point. And, you know, every time I rewatch an episode, I I see things I haven't seen before. Um, Bob Monroe, when he was on, said the same thing, and he's seen them like 30 sometimes or something. (laughs) Um, So it will be really interesting to see watching the whole thing, the whole 10 episodes back to back, what I pick up on that I missed because I think in addition to just seeing everything again, kind of seeing everything in context, like all at once and not having to wait a week for every episode may reveal some things that, that we missed the first few times around. Good point. Yeah. So I'm still curious how many people are binge watching the show now who haven't been watching you know, and we're just like, you know, this looks cool, but I'm going to wait until the whole season's out and then binge it. I think honestly, if, if we weren't doing the podcast, that's what I would do for season two. Okay. Because I mean, it's great watching them every week and, and it's fun to be, you know, kind of with everybody else watching them. And, and a lot of the people involved with the show will live tweet and stuff while, while the show's on. That's all really great and all, but you know, it's really hard waiting you know, a week for the next installment. (laughs) And and it's also, I don't feel like it's the best way to experience a story. I I feel like the best way to experience a story is to sit down and watch, you know, two, three, four episodes at a go and just chunk it out in a couple, two, three days. Um, I I know, you know, I think we've talked about on the show before, we we do that with Game of Thrones. When a new season comes out, we'll binge watch the last season. Mm -hmm. And even though, it's like the second time I've seen it, I feel like I get more out of it that second time. 
it, it feels more like you're experiencing it as perhaps the the makers of the show intended it or just, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's what it feels like to me too. It, it's like if you read a novel, you don't like read a chapter and then wait a week to read the next chapter. Right, And exactly. if you did, you'd forget half the things that happened in the last chapter. <laughs> so Exactly. I connect the dots a lot more easily when I binge watch something. Yeah, yeah, totally. The only problem with that is then it's gone, right? <laughs> right. It's like Jessica Jones. We watched that in like a week or something. It was like, <laughs> well, now what do we do? <laughs> I guess we could watch it again. <laughs> so I guess I guess that's going to wrap it up for episode 18. And again, just, just keep an eye on the website and Twitter and uh, the feed for the podcast. And, and hopefully we'll we'll have some more episodes coming out here and there. Uh, while we're waiting for season two. But until then, conserve your oxygen and your water. Resources are scarce out in the outer solar system. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Flip and burn. Did James S.A. Corey get off of Eros in time? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good point. Daniel and Ty, did did you guys get irradiated and protomolecule, or (laughs) did you get off somehow? Wait, that didn't come out right. Donkey balls. 